Hi everyone, welcome back to another video. Today we're going to be talking about the outer solar system. So let's get right into it. When exploring the outer solar system, we first have to talk about another asteroid belt. It is beyond Neptune and it is known as the Kuiper Belt. The Kuiper Belt starts at about 30 AU away from the Sun. However, it ends as far away as 1000 AU away from the Sun. The belt is composed of asteroids and dwarf planets. However, some of the most well-known dwarf planets in the belt are Eris, which is the most massive dwarf planet in the entire solar system, Haumea, which is one of the only non-planetary objects that has rings, uh, Make Make, which is the second most massive planet in the entire solar system, and of course, good old classic Pluto. If you recall, Pluto was once the ninth planet discovered by Saito Tamba in 1930. When he discovered it, he found that a star, a star really, was uh, moving in weird motions. It was moving way too fast, and he proposed that it was a planet. At this point, Ceres was an asteroid, and the more modified version of the IAU classification for planets and other celestial bodies in the solar system had not been fully made yet. It was most, it, at this point, it was just planets and asteroids. So when he discovered Pluto, he did the calculations and everything and proposed his first estimates that it was about the size of Neptune. But as his calculations went, he got sharper and sharper, and as other people started doing more estimates, the, estimate, the estimated size of Pluto began to shrink little by little, until it got to a point where it was the smallest planet in the solar system. In the late 2000s, however, Eris was discovered. Eris proved to be a testimony to Pluto's title as the ninth planet, because as after the discovery of Eris, which at this point was believed to be uh, larger than Pluto, more of these bodies started to be found, like Make Me, Kalmeya, and others, loads of others, until we got a similar problem that we had with Sirius. Afterwards, the, in 2006, the IAU uh, held an official conference, and they declared the new rules for dwarf planets and planet classification. If it orbits another planet, it is a moon. If it does, if it does orbit a star, but it is not a spherical shape, because it is too small and it cannot be in a sphere shape, then it is an asteroid. If it isn't orbiting a star or a planet or anything, it's a meteor. A meteoroid, really. And if it's too crowded and there are too many objects near it, and it cannot clear its more or less celestial neighborhood, so it's just it and, the, and its moon, then it is a dwarf planet. As a result, Ceres was actually upgraded to a dwarf planet, however, Pluto was downgraded to one as well. Coincidentally, around the same time, a spacecraft was sent called New Horizons that was sent to study Pluto itself. It was one of the fastest spacecraft in all time, and when it arrived in 2015, it took some of the most infamous photos of the dwarf planet Pluto and were actually the first up-close photos. In fact, that sort of heart formation that you can probably see in the image being shown um, here is actually a um, sort of spot of nitrogen ice, and it is known as the Tomba Regina. Some of the things that it found about Pluto is that it had an atmosphere made of haze, and the atmosphere was very interesting. You see, the atmosphere, when Pluto had it, Although it was so small, not nearly as the size of Earth, when it had its atmosphere, it was about the size of the planet Earth. However, the atmosphere expanded and contracted depending on what season it was. In the summer, in the summer seasons, it uh, expanded and it was like this, about the size of Earth. But when it became the winter seasons, it contracted. Pluto is so cold that the literal air, the molecules in the air, freeze. When New Horizons kept on its mission and exploring the Kuiper Belt, it encountered another celestial body in New Year's of 2019. 486958 Arokov was, is an asteroid 
that is believed to have been formed by a very slow and gradual collision of two other celestial bodies, preferably um, dwarf planets or asteroids themselves. Because the collision was so slow and took it over the place of thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of years, because they were so slow, they basically fused into one and merged into what you can see here. However, once you reach a specific point in the Kuiper Belt, you start to encounter something. You see, just like how the Earth has its magnetic field to protect itself from the ultraviolet rays from the Sun, the Sun itself has a magnetic field to protect itself from the radiation such as gamma rays from things like uh, supernovae. As a result, this, uh, ground, this lowers the threshold on how close a star has to uh, go supernova in order for it to be harmful for life in the solar system. And this magnetic field that the sun has is known as the heliosphere. The very edge of the heliosphere is known as the heliosheath. And the very border between the heliosphere and interstellar space is known as the heliopause. Only two spacecraft have been able to exit the heliopause. These two are Voyager 1 and, can you guess it? Voyager 2. Voyager 1 was sent to explore Jupiter and Saturn, which it did, and took, of course, some gorgeous photographs of the two gas giants. And Voyager 2 was, as you recall from the Ice Giants radio, sent to explore Uranus and Neptune and took the only close-up photographs that we have of the two majestic Ice Giants to date. And Voyager 1, uh, while it kept its linear path, it exited the uh, heliosphere in 2012. However, Voyager 2, after visiting the Ice Giants, turned up and exited like that. So the two spacecraft were on the same path until they until Voyager 2 exited like that. It, it found different readings when it exited the heliosphere in 2018, and it confirms more or less that the heliosphere isn't actually uniform, but actually has a uh, shape that looks a little bit more like this, with some new uh, findings and discoveries. When the two spacecrafts uh, reached the, the heliopause, uh, about 120 AU away from the sun in the Kuiper Belt, they uh, recorded that there was, in fact, an increase in interstellar weather that the sun's magnetic sphere was blocking out. This weather, it could be harmful to types of life on in the solar system. However, the solar system doesn't end in the heliosphere. Once you exit the heliosphere, you're on in interstellar space. However, you're not outside of the solar system just yet. For that, you're gonna have to exit the Kuiper Belt and then enter what is known as the Oort Cloud. The Oort Cloud, to sum it all up, is where all the comets come from. Basically, there was this scientist and researcher called Van Oort, who had already long, more or less located where we are in the Milky Way galaxy, and had an idea. Most of the comets at this point had unknown origins. However, he theorized that what if these comets come from a bubble that surrounds the solar system made entirely of comets that he called the Oort Cloud because it is just that, it's more of a bubble, not really a disk like most of the other things. It's a bubble that surrounds the solar system and is actually, um, you know, a cloud more or less. Uh, his discovery um, uh, fixed and actually explained a lot of things in science and although it's not confirmed it's more or less um, accurate with a lot of findings that we have today. The Oort Cloud is thought to begin at um, about 2,000 to 5,000 AU away from the Sun, but some estimates put the beginning of the Oort Cloud as far as 50,000 AU away from the Sun, or about 0.79 light years away. The Oort Cloud is believed to have a trillion comets and counting, and the end of the Oort Cloud is estimated to be at about 150,000 AU away from the sun, or about one and a half light years away. Once you exit the Oort Cloud, you are officially outside of the solar system. And it, won't, it will take about uh, Voyager 1 about 400 more years in order to exit the Oort Cloud. 
New Horizons will also have a journey in and of itself and will reach the heliopause in 2038. The solar system is inside of a sort of cloud of dust. It's a group of dust and this cloud is known as the local interstellar cloud or the local fluff. However, the solar system is at the very edge of the local fluff and is about to enter another uh, cloud of interstellar dust known as the G cloud. The G cloud is home to many of the most well-known stars in the galaxy, such as Sirius and the closest star to us, Alpha Centauri. Now, this is actually a system of stars. In fact, there's three of them. The first one is Alpha Centauri, and the second one is Alpha, uh, um, Alpha Centauri B. So there's Alpha Centauri A and B, also known as Alpha Centauri and Rigel Cantaris, not to be confused with the star Rigel. These two stars orbit, uh, orbit a center of mass um, in what is known as a binary star system, and they're about 80 AU away from each, um, apart from each other. There is a third, as well as a third, smaller um, star that is a red uh, type of, that is known as a red dwarf called Proxima Centauri or Alpha Centauri C. This star is about 0 0.3 light years closer to Earth and the rest of the solar system. And as a result, it is about 4.2 light years away. Alpha Centauri C or Proxima Centauri really actually has its own sort of solar system itself. It has uh, two planets that have actually been confirmed, Proxima Centauri B and Proxima Centauri C, or Proxima B and Proxima C, and a ring of dust, possibly its own asteroid belt, or in this case, because it's outside of the last planet, the Kuiper, its own Kuiper belt. Um, and possibly, um, there's the bay of another planet, uh, Proxima Centauri D, in this uh, um, solar system. Proxima C is believed to be 1.5 AU away from its uh, star and uh, putting it at the furthest planet from its uh, home star. And it is believed that Proxima um, C is actually composed of ice, while Proxima B is about 0.04 away um, AU away from its star and it's believed that it actually is in the habitable zone of its star. Now, 0.04 AU away from the star is very close. In fact, it's closer than Mercury. However, because the star is a red dwarf, meaning that's very small and very dim, um, it actually means that it is placed um, softly and firmly in its habitable zone, where liquid water can exist. Thus, Proxima B is believed to be able to sustain liquid water and possibly even life itself. Thanks for watching everyone and thanks for watching my solar system series. If you did, then give a like on this video and if you like the other videos too, then give a like on all those too. And if you like the channel, then subscribe and turn on those notifications as usual. Anyways, that'll be it for this video and just because we're done with the solar system series doesn't mean we're done making videos about space and other types of subjects such as math, history, literature, and all the all those other types of subjects remember my goal is to feed your brain packing meat for the apocalypse we're all gonna die